All right, this screencast is going to cover the bell work from Friday, February the 8th, um, titled Who's Who Among the Stars. And this is the bell work that we did. So a bunch of you guys have been out either absent for livestock or with the flu or something like that. So I figured I'd screencast it. And if you felt up to it, you can attempt it and get it done on your own. Because we did do this together in class. So you will need to make sure that you have this chart handy. Um, and it should be in an email that I have sent to you. Also, you need to make sure that you have the who's who among the stars bell work so that you can fill this out um, as we go along. Okay? All right, so get yourself um, the things that you need and a pencil to write with and join me in just a second. Okay, number one says, of the stars on the list, which star is closest to us? Well, you're going to look at the distance in light years. Okay, and if you cruise through and look very carefully, the smallest distance in light years that you get or that you can find is right here, 4.3. Now, it's maybe a little bit confusing on this chart, but Rigel Kentaurus is all one name. That's one star. So Rigel Kentaurus is actually 4.3 light years from us, and it is the closest star to us on this list. And I think it's the closest star to us besides our sun, period. Okay? Okay, so it's Rigel Kentaurus for number one. It's 4.3 light years away. What that means is even traveling at the speed of light, which is 300,000 kilometers per second, it is still going to take you 4.3 light years to get to this star. So that should give you an idea of just how spread out things are in space. All right, let's move on to number two. Which appears brighter to us, Vega or Arcturus? Well, first of all, appears brighter, that's going to be talking about apparent magnitude. So we need to go to our chart and look up the apparent magnitude of Vega and Arcturus. All right, so Vega's apparent magnitude is 0.03. Arcturus has an apparent magnitude of negative 0.04. Remember that magnitudes, the smaller the number, the brighter the star. So Arcturus is actually the one that appears a little bit brighter because its number is smaller. Okay, the next thing that the sheet asks is what is the scientific name of Regulus? On your chart, you have a column that says scientific name and you've just got to go down the column. First of all, Regulus is its common name, so let's look it up by its col uh, common name, Regulus. Okay, and where are we? Regulus, Regulus, oh, it's way down here. Okay, Regulus. Next column over tells you its scientific name and that's Alpha Leo. The way this works is all of your stars are in some constellation and there are 88 constellations. Regulus is in the constellation Leo and so you take all of the stars in a particular constellation and the scientific names sort of give you a ranking according to their brightness. So Alpha Leo, Alpha is the first letter in the Greek alphabet, so the brightest star in Leo gets designated Alpha Leo. Uh, right above it Deneb is Alpha Cygnus, meaning it's the brightest star in the constellation Cygnus. Okay, Beta Crux is the second brightest star in the constellation Crux. Okay, because Beta is the second letter in the Greek alphabet. So that's how that works. Okay. Okay, um, so the next question is what is the approximate surface temperature of Procyon? So again, we've got to go to our chart find Procyon. It's right here. And if you go over, there's no surface temperature. But there is a spectral classification letter, and that does tell us something about the surface temperature. Now we have to go look it up, but we're going to go do that. So F is the spectral classification. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to hop over to the slideshow that I shared with you guys. And a spectral class F star has a surface temperature right here, 
of 6,500 degrees Kelvin. Okay, so write that down. Okay, so hopefully the image isn't hopping around too much. But number four, remember Procyon is a spectral class F, and by looking at the chart that we just looked at, it's 6,500 degrees Kelvin. That's about 6,200 and some odd degrees Celsius, if that helps. Okay, number five, Rigel gives off the most light of all the stars on the list. All right, so gives off the most light, that's talking about absolute magnitude. All right, Rigel's absolute magnitude is negative 8.1, which two stars tie for second place on the list. So I need which ones have almost that big a negative number. So I look. All right, there's 7.2, and that's about as close as we're going to get. So 7.2 is the second place winner. That is Betelgeuse. And see if you can find another negative 7.2 further down. Okay, there it is. Go over, and that's Deneb. Okay, the next question, which are the three coolest stars on the list? Again, we're going to look at spectral type, which is the last column on your chart, because spectral type tells us not only something about the color of the star, but also its temperature. So we're going to go back to this um, chart. O's are the hottest, M's are the coolest, and there are three M's on your chart, so find them. Okay, we're going to go back. Hopefully you found on your chart the three type M's, Betelgeuse, Gekrux, I guess is how you say it, and Antares. Okay, number seven, which stars appear blue-white, Gacrux, Hadar, or Pollux? Well, again, color and temperature and spectral class are all linked, and on that chart, it tells me spectral class, so I need to look at the spectral class. Gacrux, we already know because we did it from number six. This is a type M. Hadar, look at your chart. Hadar, go over, and it is a type B spectral class, and Pollux, which is a little bit further down in the list on your chart, scroll over to Pollux, and Pollux is a type K. All right. So we're back to looking at this chart again. Gacrux would be an M, meaning it would be a red star. Hadar is a B, which means it would be kind of blue, and you could probably get away with calling that blue-white, because that's certainly the best choice, because Pollux over here is orange. So you've got a red, an orange, and a blue-white. So we're going to go with Hadar. All right. Number eight says, of Altair, Aldebaran, and Antares, which is actually the brightest? Actually the brightest is talking about absolute magnitude. And so we need to go look up the absolute magnitude of all three of these stars. And it just so happens that they're all together on our chart. So Altair, absolute magnitude, 2.3. Aldebaran, negative 0 0.3. Antares, negative 5.3. Two. So write those down real quick. All right, remember that when you talk about magnitude, the smaller the number, the brighter the star. So the smallest number or the most negative number that we have is the one for Antares. So Antares is the brightest of these three stars. Okay, number nine asks, which star appears the brightest to us besides the sun? Well, if you look really carefully at the list, you might have noticed that the list is sorted by apparent magnitude, okay? The sun's apparent magnitude is way, 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 way bigger than any of the other stars. So it's at the top of the list. So obviously it's going to appear brightest to us. But what star is next on the list? Well, that is Sirius. And almost as bright as Sirius is Canopus and then down on the list, okay? The dimmest star that is on the list is Shula, Shala, at the bottom, okay? That's apparent magnitude. That's how bright it seems to us. That's not how bright it truly is. But the question was asking, which star appears the brightest to us? And that's going to be Sirius at negative 1.46.
Okay, I'm going to do 10 and 11 together because they're both um, dealing with the star's spectral classification, and we're going to have to use that, that chart from the slideshow. All right, 10 asks, what's the approximate surface temperature of the sun? If you look on the chart, the sun is a spectral type G. The other one, number 11, asks about Pollux. Pollux appears what color? Pollux, where's Pollux? Pollux is down here further in the chart. Pollux. Pollux is a spectral type K. All right, so the sun's a G. Pollux is a K. Let's keep that in mind and write it down. Okay, and then we're going to hop over and look at the chart again. All right, the sun is a G, which means it's yellow, but they're not asking for the color. They're asking for the temperature. So G... Uh, stars are approximately 5,700 Kelvin. Okay, so the surface temperature of the sun is about 5,700 degrees Kelvin. Um, the temperature in Celsius is slightly different, but anyway. Okay, 11 Pollux appears what color? Well, remember that Pollux is a type K, and Ks are orange. So let's go back and fill that in. All right, I'm actually still looking at the um, spectral classes, the slide, and number 12 asks, how many stars on the list have surface temperatures of at least 10,000 degrees Celsius? Well, 10,000 degrees Celsius is not actually identical to 10,000 degrees Kelvin, but it's pretty close, so we'll just go with 10,000 degrees Kelvin. Um, this would be below 10,000 Kelvin, this is below 10,000 Kelvin, this is below 10,000 Kelvin, below 10,000 Kelvin, below 10,000 Kelvin. The only ones that are above 10,000 degrees Kelvin are type O stars and type B stars. So we need to count up the number of O's and B's we have on our chart. So let's go back to the chart and do that now. Okay, so I know you can't see the whole entire chart, but just skimming down, there are no type O stars. Type O stars, they exist, but they're, they're pretty rare. Um, so, no type O's, but let's see how many type B stars we have. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So there are 10 type B stars. So there's a total of 10 stars on this list that have surface temperatures of at least 10,000 degrees Celsius. Okay, so I wrote down that there were 10 of them and that they were all type B stars. Okay, so let's look now at the last question, and it is asking about the star Rigel Cantaris, which is up towards the top of the list. It's right here, okay, uh, 4.3 light years away. So we've already talked about it. Okay, the apparent magnitude of Rigel Cantaris is negative 0.27 and its absolute magnitude is 4.4. What this tells us is that, you know what, it seems to us that it's fairly bright, but it's actually not that bright. So if it seems bright, but it's not that bright, then it's probably because it's fairly close to us, and it is. Remember, it's only 4.3 light years away. So does it appear brighter than it truly is, or is it brighter than it appears? Well, the lower number was the apparent magnitude, so it appears brighter than it truly is. Why is that? It's because it's only 4.3 light years away. Okay. So that concludes the bell work for Friday, February 8th, and I hope that gives you an idea of what you missed in class and gives you an opportunity to make it up um, on your own time. Thanks.